Thank you, John, and thank you all for being here. It's a, a pleasure and an honor to be able to address an, uh, an audience in, uh, in, in Westminster in London at this critical juncture in the history of uh, the British, uh, uh, of, of the UK, uh, which is in fact a critical juncture in the history of Western democratic nations. What we're watching is in fact a great experiment to determine, to answer the great scientific question, is it possible for a nation to leave the European Union? <laughs> or is it going to turn out that the European Union simply is Hotel California? You can check out any time you like, but you can never leave. Now this is a subject that is of extremely great urgency and importance and interest, not only to you here in the UK, it's being watched carefully from India to the United States, and from Poland to Brazil, and around the world, wherever there are democratic nations. There are people who are anxiously following this question. Will the British be able to create an independent nation again? What I want to discuss today is why this is so important. Why do people care? Why is it that people feel that as the UK goes, the world goes? And the answer is that there is a broad feeling now for, for a number of years in many democratic countries that this time is not like any other time, that the ice cap is melted, that things are dramatically changing, and that this political struggle that animates Western democracies is not one that we've known. Maybe we, we, we knew it a long time ago, but in the last generation or two, certainly we haven't known it. It's a contest between two principled worldviews, one of which, which I call nationalism, is a, a principled standpoint that says that the world is governed best when nations are free to chart their own independent course according to their own political traditions, their own constitutional traditions, their own religious traditions, each nation different from the others. So a world of independent nations, that's an a, a national or a nationalist political order. And it's contrasted with what we can call an imperial political order. An imperial, an imperial order, there are many different kinds of empires, but what unites an imperial order is the firm conviction, the principled stand, that says the world is governed best when a single rule of law, a single regime of law, is imposed uniformly across as many nations as possible so that they aren't really independent because there's someone at the center who makes a decision about how to bring peace and prosperity to all. Now these two conflicting uh, standpoints, they're as old as recorded history. If you know your Old Testament, then you know that the, uh, the, uh, the idea that the God creator of heaven and earth speaks to Moses and tells him, well, I'm gonna give you a law, but it's only good within certain borders. Well, this is an incredible thing. This is the first time that we know of in recorded human history in which a God tells his people, I'm gonna give you borders and you're not allowed to cross them. You're not allowed to trouble the neighbors because they have their own land in their own ways. No God in the Middle East talked that way. The Assyrians or the Babylonians, they had gods too, and their gods told them, go out and conquer the four corners of the earth. Why? To bring peace and prosperity to the nations to eliminate ceaseless conflict. Now this is an argument, there, 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 there are good arguments on both sides. You, you can't simply wave one side away or another. Nevertheless, uh, in, in, in my book, The Virtue of Nationalism, I propose that we are in fact, that we all ought to be nationalists. That we should in fact believe and work towards a world of independent nations. Now there's a number of reasons for this. I, I, I'll, I'll touch upon them briefly. Let's consider first of all, a world of independent nations is a world that is, as I've already said, is diverse. Right? Different nations are expected and assumed to have different ways, different constitutions, different religions, that means different, different moral values. In a world in which nations are independent, each developing its own traditions, You'll, you will look at the other nations and you'll sometimes say, wow, I greatly admire them over there and maybe we should even learn from them. 
And sometimes you look at them, you'll say, what primitives, what barbarians, thank God that we, we don't live the way they do. But they may think the same about you, of course. A world of independent nations is a world of diversity. An imperial order is one that's not a world of diversity. And we can, we can see this where, where, wherever, wherever a, a, a bureaucracy declares itself to be in charge of dozens of nations and responsible for it, listen to the bureaucrats. They, they, they're always the same in every empire. They become imperious. They know what's best for all the nations. Right? Listen to the, United, the, the, the European Union as it, it progressively, with each passing year, becomes more imperious and more certain that they know how it is that everyone on earth should live. Not just everyone in Europe, everyone on earth. Speak to them, they'll tell you. They know, and surely you know, because if you don't know what they know, well, then you're some kind of primitive, right? And the same thing, the same thing is true. It's not as though uh, Americans don't have a version of this. Americans also do in, in, in their universities, in the State Department, in the, in, the, uh, uh, in the media. Americans also have developed a whole theory for how it is that Americans know exactly how everyone should live to the extent that Americans who've never visited Afghanistan can tell you exactly what their constitutional order should be and how they should regard feminism and many, many other things that I'm sure are of great interest to you as they are to people in Afghanistan. But the extraordinary thing is the belief of people sitting on the other side of the planet that they know what's best for every nation at every time. Right? This is an imperial worldview, an imperial mindset. And the politics of our generation the politics of our generation is a politics in which we are watching the contest between these two proposals for world order. We're watching a contest between the proposal that says, for example, you here in the UK don't need to make your own laws because there are experts in Brussels or maybe in Berlin who know quite well, and they'll take your input, they'll take your phone call, but those experts, they're simply going to legislate for the peace and prosperity of the entire continent, and you don't have to uh, succumb to these primitive urges to make decisions yourselves. For who are you, after all, to make decisions yourselves? The contest between that imperial view and what I see as a much more civilized, much more tolerant, European tradition of national states, of independent national states, which allow one another to be different. Now, I said that uh, a, a world of national states is a world of diversity, and a world of diversity is, in fact, a world of freedom. Of course, not every nation necessarily is going to have the same exact rights that you want them to have, but, but nations will be free to determine their course. A world of competing nations is also a world of competition. Right? And this is, I think, at the heart of the nationalist argument. Nationalists are not only looking for freedom, they also believe in the advancement of mankind. But there's an argument about how mankind advances. From the perspective of a nationalist, the way mankind advances is through the competition of different cultures that have different ideas. Some will succeed and some will fail. Right? Why is it that, that people can imagine that in a market economy, different companies compete with one another because central planning dictating how each company should operate doesn't work? But when it comes to international relations and, and the political and economic order of the entire planet, suddenly people are sure we know the answer, how to govern the entire planet. But a nationalist says no. A nationalist says no. We need the competition among nations. We need that freedom because through the trial and error, right, each nation becomes a kind of an experiment in what it means to live as human beings. Each nation becomes an experiment in what it means to live as a society. And some will succeed and some will fail. Through that trial and error, mankind learns. Right, through that trial and error, virtually everything that is of, of value that we love about, uh, uh, about antiquity or about the model, modern world comes from the competition of these small nations, almost nothing from, from the, the, these vast empires, if you think about it. Consider democracy. We love the fact that we live in, in free and democratic nations. But where did democracy arise? Well, in the, the form in which we know it, democracy arose here. It arose here, it arose in England. 
And England was able to make the transition to democracy, was able to make the transition to uh, a society of people who trust one another enough to be able to take turns electing governments, some of which are more successful than others, but, but the trust that's necessary to take turns electing governments, that's democracy. Well, that arose here in, in England. It arose within a national state, within the framework of a nation state, right? And the, 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 the free market, you can say, well, it, it has uh, uh, forerunners in, 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 in uh, the Netherlands, in Holland, as a, again, an independent national state. And you can keep going. Everything that you love about life in the modern age comes from the competition, even science. Even science is the result of the competition between these, these nations. There is no record in human history of a, an empire that sees its role as the, conquer, the conquest of dozens of other nations to bring them to an order that they didn't ask for. There's no such thing as a case of such an empire which is Began, begins to move towards democracy. The opposite. The further that you expand, the further you get, the, 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 the more peoples you get under your wing, the more you have to oppress them because they don't want to live the way that you want them to live. That dynamic means that in order to have democracy, in order to have the kinds of freedoms that we're used to, as far as we know, you can only have them in a national state where there's sufficient cohesion so that people are willing to minimally trust one another. And you can say, well, I know there's a democracy deficit in the European Union, and it's true that the Europeans uh, tend to do things like uh, vetoing the Italian national budget or replacing the Italian's finance minister but ultimately, the EU will evolve into some kind of a democratic institution. All right, so we'll just have to simply place bets on that because I can't prove it to you. You'll never see anything resembling democracy in the European Union for the simple reason, and this is John Stuart Mill made this argument, who, John Stuart Mill, who's familiar with some empires, uh, made this argument about 150 years ago in his, uh, on representative government. He said, you can't possibly have people in England ruling India because the people in England don't know enough about India to rule India. They don't have time to learn enough to rule the people in India. And even if they did have the time, even if they wanted to spend the time to rule the people in, to learn to, what they need to rule the people in India, how would they do it, says Mill? They would do it by interviewing people, by, by leaders in India to try to understand what's going on, and then they would be ma manipulated by the leaders in India of one faction against another. There is no way to be outside of a society on the other side of the planet and to know what's happening there. There is no way. And the, uh, the, the, the arrogance that leads you to believe that you can know is itself what causes you to be ever more tyrannical in your dealings with people because you believe you know. All right, so this is, this is, an, this is an argument for, for democracy. It's an argument not just for national freedom, but an argument for the fact that, that democracy arises in some national states, maybe not in all of them. But as far as we know, to bring a nation that's a democracy under a universal government of the kind that the EU is, this is to, to give away the, the, the country's freedom. Now, you may not want that freedom. You may think, I'd rather that experts take care of my military affairs and my economic affairs, and they're smart enough, and they'll do well, so fine. So, so you're an imperialist, and you can be a loyal subject of, of that empire. But as I say, throughout the world, there are people who hope for a different kind of world, a world in which countries will compete, a world in which there will be experiments, a world of trial and error. And let me just add one other thing, a world of tolerance. When is it that tolerance 
be begins to become a, a value in the European context? Well, it's after, after, uh, after Westphalia. You can say actually since Augsburg, whatever. The, 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 in the 16th century, in the 17th century, when the Catholics are forced to admit the legitimacy of Lutheran and Calvinist regimes, and each of them is forced to admit the legitimacy of the others, it doesn't mean that you have to like them. It doesn't mean that you have to, to, res to, to respect them beyond the amount of respect that's necessary to say we don't go to war against them because they're Catholics. We don't go to war against them because they're Lutherans. It's at that moment that the nations start to bargain with one another about the status of minorities within their countries, and it's that moment that official tolerance becomes a value. The same, the same, the same time that, that democracy is arising, tolerance is arising because of the competition among nation states. We live in a world in which democracy, and, and I, I'm sorry, in which tolerance is disappearing. Surely you know this. A generation ago when I was growing up, you could say whatever you wanted. Uh, people would, would call you names because you had the wrong views. They'd call you names, but nobody thought that you would lose your career because you expressed an opinion. Nobody thought that, that you, would, you would be uh, uh, publicly uh, 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 assailed in your community, maybe internationally, because of the fact that you expressed the wrong opinion. Ask yourself, where is this coming from? It's not coming from nationalists, because we haven't had nationalists running countries for a long time, uh, up until very, very recently. No, this intolerance is the result of the advance of a, of a universal idea, of an imperialistic idea, that there's a certain set of rights and a certain set of people at the universities who know how to interpret them, and they have the final answer about who it is who's allowed to speak and what it is that they're allowed to say. And with every passing year, they make changes to it and make the, 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 the system purer and tighter and make fewer and fewer of us able to say what it is that we want to say. It's not nationalism that's brought us to this elimination of freedom of speech, one of the most precious things that had been developed in the Anglo world, in the democratic world. It's liberalism. It's this universal theory that's eliminating freedom of speech. You can think it's ironic, it's a fact. Why? Because if you're a nationalist, and I'm, of course there are good people and bad people on, on, on both sides, but in general, if you're a nationalist, your point of view is, I want to be able to run my country as I see fit. And I want them, the others, to be able to run their countries as they see fit. And that's a fundamental posture, that's a virtue, that's a posture of tolerance, which is bred in a nationalist order, in an order of independent nations. Whereas an imperial order breeds intolerance. There's one answer, it's good for all of mankind. And if you dissent, well then you're, you're threatening the entire order. I wanna say something about Britain. I wanna say something about Britain. I, I'm an Israeli. And, uh, of course, Britain has not always had the smoothest of relationships with, uh, with, uh, with Israel. And yet, there is great admiration for Britain in, in Israel. And I, I would say, in, just in, in, in general, if you could oversimplify in this way, I, I think in general, Jews have seen Britain as a, as a, as a model for a very, very long time. Uh, the, the, the British were among the first to be interested in returning the Jews to, uh, to their land. And the British built an, a, an independent nation that was to a very significant degree in many periods influenced by the Bible and specifically by the Old Testament. And the Zionist leaders who built the state of Israel from Herzl to Ben-Gurion saw Britain as a model, as an ideal, what should, what should the Jews look like when we return to our land and have our country? And they saw Britain as the example. Now what I find that's, I, I find surprising, but actually even a little bit painful, is to 
meet to meet people here in, 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 in London, to meet British people, and I say, you know, around the world, there are people who long to see Britain be independent again, to see Britain be strong, because people believe that great things will come of Britain. And they say, you know, I don't, I don't want to be bigoted about this. Meaning about them, they don't want to be bigoted by saying great things could come of their own country. It's, it, 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 it's sad and it's difficult to understand. All right, so I'm not British. I'm not English. So I have a right to, you know, I don't have to be embarrassed. I can just tell you what I think of your country. I think that this is the land of John Fortescue. I don't know if you know who John Fortescue is. Some of you do, I see some nodding. In the 1400s, John, John Fortescue, he was the, 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 uh, uh, the, the uh, chief justice of the king's bench and ended up going into exile. He wrote a marvelous book called In Praise of the Laws of England. And if you go back to that book today, you can see that much of what we consider to be the greatest, the greatest principles of constitutionalism, not just Anglo-American, but in the world, principles like the, the separation of powers and limited government and the fact that property is protected even against the whim of the king, and you can go on and on. These principles in the 1400s are written in the plainest possible language as something that is the inheritance of all Englishmen, the rights of Englishmen. And compared to the French and to the Germans, and Fortescue says, look at the tyranny in these countries and the freedom that there is in England because our laws give us freedom. And he explains how it works. And he's talking about something that already in the 1400s, he's looking back and saying, this is our inheritance for centuries. This is a great nation. This is a nation that's given freedom to the entire world, that's taught the world freedom. Or John Selden, it's the nation of John Selden. Americans like to talk about the, the Bill of Rights, but it was John Selden in the 1620s who drafted the first petition of right to the Stuart Kings and said, look, there are rights that need to be defended against the king here. I'm gonna write them down for you so you can remember them. Modern constitutional, constitutionalism is a gift of the English to the rest of the world. And since we're talking about the UK, I don't want to skip Hume and Smith, among other things, the creation of modern economic science, which is a creation of the British Isles, of the British peoples. How about Harvey and Boyle and Newton? It's here in England that modern science was created. Here in England. And I know sometimes people say to me, don't, don't talk to me about all this emotional stuff. This isn't emotional stuff. I mean, it's emotional, but this is the real stuff. This is your inheritance. This is your heritage. This is an extraordinary people of the kind that virtually has never been seen in history in terms of what it's contributed and what it's created. You're going to tell me that today you don't have the power. You don't have it in you anymore. You don't have the strength to be able to rise to do new great things. I don't believe you. Now the UK, in comparison to other countries, it's one of the strongest con economies in the world. You have a powerful arm, ar armed forces. This is a country that is capable of, of, of being independent and wielding independent power to an extent that most other countries in the world are not capable. And what's keeping you back? You're afraid. Your government is afraid. I'm sorry, I apologize. It's not my place to say it, but someone needs to say it. They're afraid. They're afraid to have to make the decisions themselves. They're afraid of what will happen if they go over a cliff. They're afraid. Now, you have to understand this, that to be an independent nation, you make mistakes. Bad things happen to you. You lose wars. You get bad leaders. Of course, that's true everywhere. But like with the... A child becomes an adult, not when everything is guaranteed and taken care of by somebody else. A child becomes an adult when the child 
man or woman, takes responsibility for his or herself and says, I'm not going to be afraid anymore. I'm going to make the decisions myself. And if I'm wrong, I'll, be, I'll, I'll, I'll deal with what happens. I'll fix things. If, if, if events punish me, so I'll learn. And when you talk about the life of a nation, that means that there's the possibility of, of great leaders arising. People who've learned, people who understand, people who have hard, hard, hard experience. But if someone else is making all the decisions, then you've simply decided that here in the UK there aren't going to be great men and women anymore. Because somebody else will make all the decisions and you'll simply accept it. Now this is intolerable to watch. I can't, you know, I, it's your decision to make, it's not mine. But you should know, you're not alone. You should know that around the world, tens of millions of people in countries everywhere look to the UK to see whether national freedom and independence is still possible, whether recovering the greatness of a nation that was extraordinary, unparalleled in the last thousand years, whether that's still possible. And it's up to you to decide whether it's possible or not. And if, if you're going to, the decision you're going to make is that you, look, I'm, I, I'm sorry, but we need, a, we need the permission of the German chancellor to leave. That's what it means to have an agreement. All right, people say, t tell me, you know, there's many kinds of Brexit. But there aren't, it's not true. It's not true, it's just, it, it's, it, 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 it's eyewash, it's, it's just, it's just miss, missed and obfuscation. There's only one kind of Brexit, right? But there's only one kind of independence. The difference between independence and, and being part of an empire is only one thing. It's, it's the thing that was decided by, 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 the, British, by, by the English commons in, in the 1530s. It's the decision that no foreign government and no foreign court has jurisdiction in these aisles. And that the decisions will be made by our government and by our courts, and they supersede and override anything that any, anyone else wants to dictate here. That decision was made by the English Parliament, by Henry VIII. It was made by you, by the English people, and then became a model for nations all the world over, including mine, including independent Israel. That's the decision that needs to be made again. And this, is not, this has nothing to do with the question of what's the best way to work this out economically. You'll work it out economically. It'll be worse, it'll be better. But if you don't retake your freedom, then it may be generations. God forbid, it may never happen again. And that would be a blow to the UK, but that would be a blow to all of us, all of us who hope for national freedom, who hope to see a world of independent nations. All of us will suffer the consequences if you can't find the strength in yourselves today to do what needs to be done. It's such a great honor and a pleasure, as I said, to be allowed to come and speak and to, to say these things. I hope you don't take offense.